and society expects you and culture to be a certain way. Mm. How have you been able to navigate that and deal with it when societies and people are looking at you wondering, she's still crying over that? She should be over it by now. Thankfully, if they think that, they've never asked me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they've never asked me because you never get over anyone. No. And people should be allowed to hang on to the memories of their loved ones, to grieve the way they want to grieve. When I look at my brother Kamau, I'm thinking, hey, dude, you're strong. Because he's a typical Kikuyu man. They don't cry. No. They don't crack. <laughs> but then the world cracks them in the process. And I saw what, that's how it happened with my brother Ken in 2019. Because he yeah. didn't process it. It processed him and took him. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, so... Allow yourself to grieve, and it doesn't matter whose script you're following. Follow only your script. Maggie can tell you to seek therapy. Maybe therapy is not, not for you. you. Maggie will tell you to run. <laughs> That's Maggie's remedy. Maybe it's not for you. Find whatever it is that works for you. Welcome to the Lioness Grow To podcast, where we talk about money, beauty, wellness, fashion, entrepreneurship, so that we can educate, embrace your journey as a black woman navigating through life, share our experiences, empower, and encourage to be your limitless self. Today, we delve into a topic that a lot of us have struggled with in life, and this is loss, grief, and healing. And joining me today is an incredible, beautiful, resilient woman. One of the most resilient women I know, Maggie Waitheru, as we delve and talk about healing and how we go through life after any kind of loss and grief to still end up on the other side and be our limitless self. So Maggie, thank you so much for coming. Thank and you. I met that. I have known you for 10 years now. This year we met in 2014. Yeah, depends on when you came. Yes, indeed. Yes, we met in 2014. Wow. wow. Very, very, very early on. And somewhere about two years into knowing each other, we actually shared some grief. Actually, I think it was within a month. So before we go into all that, can you tell us who you are, what makes you tech and do what you do? Anna, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate and I'm happy to see you after a long time. And to talk about a topic I am passionate about, the topic being healing. Yeah. Healing from within, healing from outside, whatever healing means to you. And whatever it is that's causing that healing is something that I can talk about all day, every day. Mm -hmm. I am a nutrition wellness coach. I have not always been a nutrition wellness coach. Mm -hmm. I have been working in the UN for years. And as my life shifted in 2018, I also shifted in my direction and I got myself into this space. I am therefore a nutrition wellness coach right now, something that I hope I can do for the rest of my life because that's the one thing we all do. We all eat. We yep. all live. Yep. Now, it's to eat and to live healthy, irrespective of what the circumstances are, just to prioritize your wellness through food. And that could also mean priority, prioritizing your wellness through relationships, through inner healing, through whatever it is that it takes for you to be well. I can have a conversation about that every day and I'll get tired. Once again, thank you for having me here this evening. Thank oh, you absolutely. so much, Maggie. So for me, like I said, we became friends. I've always loved your sense of life, laughter, and just being. And in 2016, I lost my brother. It's the first time I had experienced loss that deep. Mm. And I think you had just lost your brother about two weeks earlier. Mm. And... Me watching you in those moments when I thought I couldn't live anymore, I mm. couldn't go on, mm. I have actually never told you this, mm. made me realize there is a bigger purpose. Wow. So 
do you mind walking us through your journey of how you got to be that way, dealing with grief, where it all began? I know it's very, very long for you. <laughs> and that's why I say you're probably one of the strongest, yeah. resilient people I know. Remind me, when did Paul pass away? 2016, February. February? Yeah. Sure, that's exactly a few weeks after I had lost my brother. Exactly. Uh, I want to say that, yo, that I'm resilient. I am not. I don't find resilience by myself. It's a journey and it takes all manner of forms. But let me first tell you my first experience with loss. That dates back to 1995. I lost my sister to suicide at a time when suicide was seen as weakness, selfishness. Mm -hmm. There was no support system. Actually, the church did not even honor you. We were lucky because my mother, Mrs. Waithiro, was working for the church that the church did honor her by burying her and having the conversation or rather, should I say, the the service, service at home. But otherwise, you're told to just go bury your own, figure it out. And as I watched my parents deal with the loss of my sister, I couldn't understand, why aren't you crying? Why aren't you feeling how I'm feeling? Because it caught me 100% flat-footed. I did not deal with it very well. I was in my 20s. There was no support system. And I say there was no support system because it is a death that is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Who goes and kills themselves? Add to this, Anna, I don't know if you remember, but other than the fact that my mom was working for the church, my dad was a church elder, mm -hmm. everyone is looking at them thinking, hmm, mm -hmm. so you worship God. Look, what has what? happened to you? Yeah. They did not have the tools to support us as children. And for me, being the last born, my sister was the only sister I had. I did not know how to cope. I just moved on with life. When I look back, which I did actually two years ago, I looked back at every decade of my life. And when I got to my 20s, I stopped. I couldn't deal with it. Because that's when I was first introduced to death. Yeah. And without any tools on how to cope. Come 30s, Another death, I lost my dad. And my dad's death, again, caught me flat-footed. I don't think, when I say flat-footed, I don't think there is any time that death can find you aware. No. Whether the person has been ailing, is bedridden for years, or the person is very old and into their hundreds, I promise you one thing. You still feel it. You still feel it. Even if you're willing to let go, you will still feel it. Because the one thing that you've not prepared yourself mentally for is how are you going to cope now that Paul is no longer there? Yeah. How are you going to cope now that Shiro, that's my sister, is no longer there? Or my dad or all the other people that I have lost along the way. Nothing prepares you for it. So I can't tell you that there's a silver bullet on how to cope. Mm -hmm. Every season presents different avenues for you to be able to cope and to navigate the situation. So 20s, your sister, 30s, your, and then in your 40s, it was your brother. And then in the same year, your mom. Like who does that? Yeah. I had to ask God, like seriously, God, and the other people in this village or in this world that you can take, why do you have to keep visiting our home? Yeah, so my dad died in 2009 when I was pregnant with the girls. I, so he never got to see them and it really broke me. And then come 2016, first, go back to 2014, my brother who died in 2016 fell sick and he was in hospital for 54 nights, half of which was in ICU. And every day you're going in and you're thinking, this might be the last day. Mm -hmm. And he comes out and he's fine. And then poof. He's gone. He's gone. And I still recall seeing him right in front of his gate. He had just got on, gotten out of school. He was a head teacher. He had gotten out of school to come and sort out some farming admin issues. And I saw his car and I called him out to say hello. It had rained cats and dogs that day. But just when there was like a bit of flicker of sunlight, I called him out and we chatted a little bit. I didn't know that was the last time I was going to see Mwangi. But I hung on to those memories. 
Then 2016, my mother dies. And the only reason, my brother was in January, and then my mother was in September. Mm -hmm. September is a very dark month for me because that's when I lost my sister, that's when I lost my mom and my dad. And you can decide all the months are bad. We had that conversation. Had, yeah, yeah, you can, that you conversation. can take every month of the year because every month you might have something hard going on. But yeah, September, I hold my breath until the 30th and I'm like, I can breathe a little bit. And for me, it's, I told you it was February. For me, it's, I hate February. I'm glad it's the shortest month <laughs> because it's like, I hate February until 28th. Actually, I think the 1st of March yeah. is when, because actually Paul died on February 29th. So, this year. To 2016. And this, and this year so, it was a leap year. Yeah, this year is a leap year. So, until March 1st, oh. I hate that month. Sure. So, I can understand you Ooh. hating September, but then you can't, because then your brother is January. So, you could also decide to, you know, hate January. True. So, how have you dealt with that? Like, okay, I know September is not the greatest month, but... How do I navigate so I'm not dark throughout September? You know, I, again, I wish we could have a silver bullet, something that works for everyone. What has worked for me is a very good support system. I'm very relational. I don't know whether I hold on to relationships now because of the losses, because I don't know when someone is going to go. I know this is the beginning of the year. People have huge plans for the year. There's no guarantee that we're going to be able to achieve them. Uh, I therefore hold on to relationships very much. I cherish them. That doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. I hope I wouldn't, but I am only human. So I hang on to my relationships because I know if I did not have my support system, my girlfriends, there's a small core of girlfriends. We actually call each other girlfriends. They held me. They carried, I call them also my pallbearers because they really help, helped me survive through the most difficult times. There is that. But back to 2016, when at some point in June, July, I realized that for the last three months prior to that, I was crying every day, several times a day. And I didn't pay attention to it until one day I... I'm having a conversation with a colleague and I told her, we can't have this meeting. I'm feeling very giddy. And she asked me what's going on. And I told her, after I lost my brother in January, I don't think I've processed it. And she told me one thing, Maggie, seek help. I had sought help in 2010. After your dad. After my dad. Mm -hmm. Because I realized I was looking in the mirror and I never looked at myself. Does that make sense? Yep. The mirror is there. You're looking at yourself. I do my hair. I do my makeup. But I cannot even tell you what my face is saying. And I saw a therapist all of one session. She told me what I needed to do. I didn't really connect with her, so I never go, went back. Then in 2016, when Melba told me, Maggie, seek help, I sought help. And I went, I saw a, a therapist called Mumbi, and she helped me through a very difficult season because at that point I was really struggling. So I have talked about relationships mm -hmm. and I've talked about therapy. In 2009, I did not go for, uh, in 1995 when I lost my sister, I did you not didn't. go for help. Mm -hmm. Who went for help in the 90s? Seriously, yeah. <laughs> in the 90s. I don't even think therapists made any money. No. If you were seen to be weak, if you go to a therapist. Mm -hmm. So that, that is why I did not have that as an option. But now, later on, I had the option of therapy. Mid-2016, I was going back to say that sometime in August, I just had this overwhelming feeling, and I thought, I'm going to give my life to Christ. And I did. August 22nd. And tuck, on the 30th of August, my mom got their first heart attack. I would have lost my mind. If at that point, I did not have the Holy Spirit taking care, honestly, I would have died. So I have Mombi working with me, and I have God, God who are holding me. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks after that, she died. So I had the, the support system of my friends, therapy, the church community. 
and the, the church community also talk about my relationship with God mm -hmm. because the church showed up and they continued to show up even well after my mom's funeral. They were still very supportive. Every now and then they'll invite us to things that have nothing to do with us because they know there is where we get our support. So do not underestimate the importance of having a society behind you. I don't care how much of a, what would I say? I'm a, what, do, what are the words? I'm a lone person, mm -hmm. not introversion, because it's not introversion. Enjoy your alone time and like being by yourself, yourself. and not alone around people. I'm telling you that will never work when you're going through difficult times. And I'm not a psychologist, I don't know. But I know it's very hard to deal From with experience. it by yourself. There are platforms online. I know there is, there is one called Calm, which is Campaign Against Living Miserably. It's a platform where you can call anybody, anytime when you're struggling. I wish my sister had that in 1995. Yeah. Maybe she would still be alive. So just look for the tools that you can use based on your personality and based on what you can access. Because nobody, not everybody can access everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe people don't have the kind of girlfriends I have. Or you don't go to church and you don't believe in God. But if you believe in anything, whether it's whatever your religion, find an avenue where you are never, ever going to walk alone. Because if you walk alone, you will go down the very dark road. I, I remember coming for your mom's funeral and seeing you and how strong you looked. And I was still so miserable from losing my brother. And I was like, wow, how is she able to, she just lost her brother. It's nine months later. She's lost her mother and still can stand up. And I remember the girlfriends. I've met mm. them before. Some mm. of them I was actually in high school with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was in awe. But what I didn't realize is the internal, because we never talked about it yeah. at that time. You are helping me just from observing from afar. Mm -hmm. The other thing I realized we never do as a society mm -hmm. is we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, on Christmas Day, I, I overheard, I was there when the conversation was being heard. And someone asked, has this friend of theirs, I don't know their friend, gotten over the loss of their husband? And one of them said, oh, of course, it's been three years. Why would she still be grieving? And, <laughs> Don't let me start it. and I just, I didn't say anything. I was just like, wow. So they talk about grief, about being a roller coaster of emotions. And we all grieve differently and society expects you and culture to be a certain way mm -hmm. how have you been able to navigate that and deal with it when societies and people are looking at you wondering she's still crying over that she should be over it by now thankfully if they think that they've never asked me <laughs> yes <laughs> they've never asked me because you never get over anyone no and people should be allowed to hang on to the memories of their loved ones, to grieve the way they want to grieve. When I look at my brother Kamau, I'm thinking, hey, dude, you're strong. Because he's a typical Kikuyu man. They don't cry. No. They don't crack. <laughs> but then the world cracks them in the process. And I saw what, that's how it happened with my brother Ken in 2019. Because he yeah. didn't process it. It processed him and took him. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, so... Allow yourself to grieve, and it doesn't matter whose script you're following. Follow only your script. Maggie can tell you to seek therapy. Maybe therapy is not, not for you. you. Maggie will tell you to run. <laughs> That's Maggie's remedy. Maybe it's not for you. Find whatever it is that works for you and hang on to it. Draw from it. I journal a lot. I journal when I'm happy. I journal when I'm angry. I journal when I'm bored. I just journal. You will find your own tool that will help you navigate whatever emotions that you're going through. And you talk about roller coaster of emotions. And that's when I'm saying grieving, does, grieving never ends. What do I mean by that? Have you ever gone to a funeral of somebody that you hardly know, but you're so sad? Yeah. It feels like that wound that had healed has now been opened. Mm -hmm. So you're not actually crying for that person who's gone. You're grieving afresh. 
for the person you lost. Yeah. yeah. And for me you now with five people, I, I don't even know whom I'm grieving. At that point, if you ask me, whom am I crying about? I don't know. It could be anyone. That or could be something that has been said that reminds me of that pain. So I celebrate the good things that we shared because naturally there were many more, there were more good things to celebrate about the lives of the people that we have lost. And when I say we, I said we as a family, but it doesn't mean that I don't feel the pain of the fact that I can no longer share a moment of joy with them. Mm-hmm. And we say we will meet in heaven. Yes, Jui, maybe. Maybe. It's a maybe. I don't know how, I don't know how it looks. <laughs> right. And I can't convince anybody how it looks. We hang on to that as Christians, that there is another life and we will meet in that big palace. Whatever, yeah. yeah. It looks like, because none of us know. No, none of us knows. Mm-hmm. So, but and C.S. Lewis, I don't know if you've listened to his book, A Grief. A Grief. No, I have not. I've forgotten the, the, the whole, whatever... The title. Mm-hmm. Like whole title. But he says, don't tell somebody that the person is in a better place. How do you know? How do you know that they were not happy here? And how do exactly. you know? <laughs> I've actually never thought about it right? that way. They're happy yeah. on the other side. You don't know. We don't know. Mm-hmm. Those are not consoling words. Just hold on. Just sit there with the person who is grieving. If they have anything they want to share, whatever that emotion, they will share. Just be there. Just listen and hold on to that person. So you've lost five people because the thing we haven't shared in later, was it 2019, you lost another brother. And how have you turned that pain and so much grief and sometimes blame on God? Like why? Into something purposefully, purposeful and teach others and to help others and channel this thing into becoming wellness and unveiling a whole new side of you that guides others through the process. Because you could choose to be angry. Mm-hmm. The one person I have never been able to blame, mm-hmm. maybe because the fear was already put in me since I was young, is God. Because God gives, God takes. Okay. And just as he gives me many good things... I don't, I don't blame him for giving me the good the things. things. Why am I blaming him for giving me the pain? Uh, so I don't blame God. The people I have blamed, for sure I blamed Shiro. Shiro is my sister. Sure, decades. Because I she blamed took. Shiro. Like, seriously, how hard could life have been for you to go? I blamed myself. Why did I not see it? Because I've had, I'd had a conversation with her on Friday, and we had agreed we'll meet on Sunday. And then, sure, she decided she, she was gone the night before, the, on Sunday night, Saturday nights, coming into Sunday morning. I blame others, including my own parents, my family members, the universe. But the one thing it never does, it never brings That's anybody cool. back. All mm-hmm. it does, it just talks your anger. It talks your pain. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that you're blaming which they're not even taking responsibility for your wellness at that point because it's, you sti- you're still alive. You're still here on earth. Mm-hmm. How am I going to make my life better because of the losses? And this is a perfect avenue. How do I help people? This is a perfect opportunity. Talk to people about pain, that it is no more to feel sad. It is no more to blame, however blame helps you. It's a, it's a stage of grief. All I can say is don't hang on to it too long that it starts to destroy you. Yeah. It's just supposed to be part of the healing process. Remember, it's a process. Mm-hmm. And don't feel bad that you're not healing fast enough. There is nobody who is assessing how fast you're going. Three years, one year, that's, that's your journey. If you heal in a year, good for you. Others, like me, might take a bit longer. And uh, what else did you ask it? Uh, how you've channeled that, not anger, but basically love and guiding others through it. Because that is, instead of being angry, you've chosen to take it and channel it into love for others. Ooh. When I switched to doing nutrition wellness coaching, I first did transformation coaching with Lisa Nichols, mm-hmm. a magnificent woman who talks she about is. motivation. Yes. And one of the assignments we had was to look at your blueprint, 
cultural blueprint, your economic blueprint, all those blueprints. What are the things that inform your life every day? And I, when I got to the cultural part, I realized that I was hanging on to the deaths, almost like a brand. Oh, Maggie. Oh, the girl who has lost so many people. Yeah. That's not my brand. My brand is I'm alive. And when I look back and I see that for Shiro, it was probably a mental illness issue. It yeah. must have been. It must Nobody have been, yeah. wakes up dying. The way I want to die is by committing suicide. I'm sure not. No. So it was a mental uh, health issues that we are not aware of. We were not aware then and we will never know. My, my dad, it was diabetes. My brother, it was acute pancreatitis. My mom, it was diabetes. And my dad, my brother was a different story altogether in 2019. All of them, lifestyle. Yeah. And all of it, I believe, could have been better if people were aware of what they're eating and how they're making everyday lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. Before you step into the car and you're going somewhere, you knew you were, I knew I was supposed to be here by two. If I left at quarter to two, what would have happened? I would Stress. have driven like a madman. Mad mad. Yeah. I may never have gotten here. Mm -hmm. Only because I didn't pay attention to the fact that I needed to be here too. I need, I got here at 1.30. I would rather be relaxed than be late, try to rush, and in the process, I die on the road. Or I kill somebody on the road. So it's those small things, just being aware of the small decisions that you're making every day from what you're putting into your body, because really, food is medicine from the head to mm -hmm. your toe it is medicine and time management sleep we we're talking about sleep. Uh, we're talking yes. about sleep yes sleep all those things are really important my tagline for this year is rest renew replenish and that is all about living intentionally and this is not a decision i made january i made the decision in october because i review my life around october so just pick whatever it is that's the theme that's going to inform your life, whether for a lifetime or for that season, but don't choose as a path that will destroy you. Actually, I'm so glad you bring that up because uh, Saturday I was having a conversation with my husband and it was a very interesting conversation. I love speed. I've talked about my love for speed. Uh, fast cars, I ride motorcycles. In my younger days, I used to speed a lot, but I no longer speed. And my husband asked me on Saturday, even when you're late, yes, even when I'm late, I, am, I no longer speed. Especially when you're late. <laughs> I no longer speed. If I'm, if I'm late, I would just let the people know I'm meeting, I'm running late. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to put my life mm -hmm. in that certain position. And I'm like, I'm already so stressed by other things going on. Mm -hmm. I am not going to let that be. Mm -hmm. So even in healing, I think making those choices of what should I just let go sometimes? Yeah. But sometimes we don't know how. You might know you need to let it go, but you don't know how. How do you do that? How, how do you usually advise someone how to let go? Because it's, it's easy to tell you, just let it go. Mm -hmm. How do I let it go? Let's, let's use blame as the mm -hmm. one that I hung on to for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I might say I, was, I blamed Shiro for a very long time. I blamed my parents. I blamed my brothers and, yeah, my brothers, because that's all I was left with. I blamed the society. Like, why is there no support system for situations like this? It didn't bring Shiro back. It just made me more bitter. So you have to think for yourself, how is this serving you and when you say you you also have to put your name how is blames serving maggie yeah how it's not i can blame everybody that doesn't mean i don't even know whether my sister would still be alive anyway even if she hadn't committed suicide right i don't know if my dad or my brothers would still be, or my mom would still be alive if things if they knew to eat better or if they had a better support system, wherever they were. I don't know. True. So hanging on to the p blame first, it's giving, it's giving those people a lot of power, yeah. by the way. Mm -hmm. It's giving them, Aish, you have that much power. You took my mother, you took my father. You Like, really? Everybody has power except me? 
No, I have the power over myself. It's actually I giving sh- away your power. You've given away so much. Mm-hmm. So I have a tattoo on my hand here that reads freedom. And the tattoo just constantly reminds me that I have a choice. Freedom is mine, but I have a choice to choose it. I can choose not to be free. That's true. Hang on to the blame. Hang on to the bitterness. Hang on to all the people who have hurt you. Hang on to them. If it serves you, it doesn't serve me. So choose what, whatever it is that you're hanging on to. Ask yourself, in fact, what, if you have a list of the things that you've been hanging on to, and when I say the things, I'm talking about negative things, and tell me one that serves you positively. Mine is guilt. And I, I've talked to you about it. Yeah. And it happened in 2016. I, I'm a proponent of therapy. I had gone for therapy many times for different things over mm. my life, but I never went for therapy for that one. Mm. One, even my parents didn't know how to process it. But interestingly enough, there's something it did for us as a family, and Mm. especially given the the tragic events around, you know, what they were, um, not ready to discuss it around post-death. We actually started sharing and actually talking to each other and hearing each other as a family. We could have chosen for it to destroy us. But for me as an individual, I didn't address it. And even knew I knew it was painful, I would wake up in the middle of night, the night from deep sleep crying. Even after years. Mm-hmm. Last year, I started going to therapy again for something mm-hmm. completely unrelated. Mm-hmm. But I still hadn't processed it. Mm-hmm. So it's actually one of the things that I need to process into that Mm. and I was talking to my therapist the other day for me it's guilt because I know you said you had some guilt about Shiro uh, because you know you had said you you know see each other and for my brother it was I was gonna go see him on Monday and I keep asking myself he died on a on a Monday he ended up dying that Monday but he was Mm. in the hospital for like a day and Mm. then on Saturday night um, whatever happened and made him end up in the hospital sure. was that. Mm. And I keep blaming myself to this day. What was I doing in Nairobi on Saturday? Why didn't I go? But I asked you the yes. other day. Actually, even the, my therapist asked me okay. this the other day. It's like, we, and we, were ha- we were having this session and it goes mm. 30 minutes over mm-hmm. and I end up in, in an accident. You probably blame yourself because you'll say, if we had ended on time, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have happened. Right. And that is the thing I'm working on letting mm-hmm. go because it destroys me. So mm-hmm. we're talking what? Eight years? Is it eight years? Going on mm-hmm. eight years? No. no. Yeah, eight mm-hmm. years. It's eight years. But I still wake up in the middle of the night crying sometimes. And majority, yes, there's a loss, there's a pain, but the guilt. Mm. And that's why I asked, you know, for me, I'm seeking help to let mm. it go. And it's easy for people. I've actually never shared this with anyone other than you mm. and my therapist. Mm-hmm. So when people are navigating through this, this loss mm-hmm. part, and mm-hmm. when you're working with them and helping them through, what is the one thing that you, you choose like, to know who the person is, why they are still struggling, and figure out tools on how to help? Like, you know, do you, you know, guide them towards a therapist? How do you do that? Because it's, their, it's part of their own wellness. Mm. Because if I'm there in pain and guilty every day, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what else. I wouldn't really care about my speeding mm-hmm. or what I'm eating. Mm-hmm. I don't care about my life. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? Primarily because I am not a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. I am a nutrition coach. Coach, yes. The coaching aspect has to always come in. Yeah. So someone comes and tells me that they are struggling and that their go-to place is eating. We need to delve deep and find out what's going on there. And that means you are not going to have a meal plan until we have figured out what's going on and what avenues you have tried to use or to navigate how to then cope with your loss. And by, by the way, we've been talking about grief as if it's all about death. No, no, grief it's can not. Be in, <laughs> for this conversation, we're only talking about death. We're but talking, yes. grief can be even like, almost like a conversation we had earlier about somebody having lost weight yeah. from one size to another. Yeah, 
But then this is apart f- away from that conversation, but you'll find, and I had this on a book I was listening to called Complications by Atul Gawade, and he said, somebody who had lost so much weight, then they go for gastric bypass. They become this person. They stop getting as much attention as they did when mm-hmm. they were overweight. Exactly. Now there's that loss of that other person they mm-hmm. were. But in this particular context where we're talking about grief of losing a loved one or even if not a loved one, maybe the person, maybe you didn't even have a good relationship with that person. Mm-hmm. So how do, would I navigate that pl- position or that place is to find out how you got there. Because I can assure you, Anna, even if Paul was alive today, you would find another thing to blame yourself for. I'm sure I would. <laughs> he would probably have gone somewhere else and then he would got, have gotten into such bad company and you're asking yourself, why on earth did I move him to wherever I moved him? You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's never a shortage of things to blame yourself for. And it goes back to what I was talking about with the power and the freedom. How much are you willing to gain back in terms of power? And how much are you willing to give up? I'm not willing to give up anything personally. I want to be able to be free. And that freedom will come at a pain because in some situations it could mean letting go of some relationships that are not serving you, that are sucking you back into your pain. You can let go. Because then those, maybe those relationships are making you grief even more than you did before, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. So just identifying those patterns for me is very important. I wish I was a psychotherapist. I'm not. Mm-hmm. But if I was, I am sure I would like be phenomenal because I have lived the pain and I know what it is that I'm talking about. So yeah, get the therapy. But also, at the end of the day, you do need to do your personal you, work. You have to do, even with therapy. Yes, you have um, to do therapy is not a magic pill. It's actually mm-hmm. guiding you yeah. to be able to do the work. Yes. And we talk about different kinds of losses. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I said I hate February. Mm-hmm. The other incident that happened in February is my mother ended up in the mm-hmm. hospital and ended up in ICU for 30 days. We talked about it. Yeah. And it took me a really long time mm-hmm. to even not be always tense even after she got well Mm. that she's not because there was a part that yes i didn't lose her Mm. but i think there's a part that you know you said your 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 brother being in icu Mm. for half you know almost Mm. you know 30 days or so Mm. but that also feels like a loss every day and a fear because you're coming in and you do not know what it's going to be and affects you. And funny enough, even after the person is well, True. it doesn't go away. Mm-mm. And you said identifying patterns, that's something mm-hmm. that had, you know, had to help me, even the way I spoke to my mother. And she actually one day complained about mm-hmm. the way we treat her. Oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Because, we, we <laughs> mm-hmm. because it's like we still treat her like a sick person. Mm-hmm. And I had to step back and go, oh, okay. She was feeling small. I need to be grateful and be okay that she's okay. So I know you talked about, you know, are there other modalities you guide people from? Again, we've talked about big other losses, even Mm. losing a job Mm. or your income potential. Mm. Mm. Uh, I would say when I left, you know, employment and went to entrepreneurship and, Mm. you know, there was a loss there Mm. of something that I was really, really good at Mm. and delving into something that was completely unknown. Mm. So which modalities do you have to advise people in your coaching to just deal or not actually deal? I hate that word. It's not to deal. It's to process. 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 Yes. (laughs) Yes. It's to process. Mm -hmm. What modality do I have? I think every client is different Mm -hmm. and every client is in a different season. In fact, the same client can come see you the next time and the direction has changed from where it was last week to something else because yeah. they've gone through some changes in their lives i i was telling a friend of mine a few weeks ago that having been gone for 5 years when i come back and i see that people have changed i would be really sad if people hadn't changed yeah because i'm hoping that people have been growing because i have grown i know i'm not who i was 5 years ago and if i find that you're still who you were 5 years ago you will not be able to connect with me um, so the modality that I, that I have is for people to be, first, always be cognizant of what's going on in your life. I know not everybody likes to journal. 
it's okay, even if you don't journal, sit with yourself and have a full conversation with yourself. And that's what journaling is. You're mm-hmm. having like a full blown conversation. conversation with yourself. Have a conversation with yourself. Check in to see how are you feeling. And allow yourself the time. Be very, very patient. Be very intentional with it. Because if you're not, you will get lost in the busyness of life. And with that, you will be overwhelmed and then you will break down. Mm -hmm. And everybody will wonder, but I thought Anna was fine. What was going on? Like, I didn't know there was anything wrong with my sister. She probably didn't didn't process anything. We didn't have the language of journaling or reading self-motivation books. Oh, I just read self-motivation books. I love true stories. I love things that I can connect with, though I read fiction. <laughs> like I went through a season of Harry Potter. I do read fiction, and I know it doesn't really help my journey, but it's also an avenue. It's so find an entertainment, your, uh, yeah. whatever, in that moment, yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. And you've known that I've always been like a fanatic of exercise. Mm-hmm. Exercise just releases those endorphins that make you feel good. Even when it's hard. I remember one time, it was immediately after Mwangi's death in 2016, and I was running on Dennis Preet. And someone saw me running and said, uh, I saw you running. It was actually Sam. I saw you running and you were holding your fists because I was tense. Wow. So you're running, but you're... But I'm tense. Mm-hmm. But along the way, I'm sure I released. Yeah. And by the time I got home, I was in a better space to be around people. So find your avenue. You like to box, go boxing. My daughter said she's going to open a rage room. If you would like to break things, break them. Go break but them. But please break. break <laughs> go, go break. Find a place to go break them, not yes, in your yes, house. <laughs> not, in that, not in anybody's house. Yes. Just find things that you can go and break and you throw them. Whether you throw stones in Karura without throwing at anyone. Find avenues that work for you and work with that. And no, if it works for me, it doesn't necessarily mean it will work for you. True. Find what works for you and work with it. We are all consistently. different people. Consistently. You have to be very patient with yourself. One of the things I find myself struggling with is I no longer know how to comfort someone who has lost someone since I lost someone through death. And especially the social media posts. I have no idea what to say. How do you advise? Like, I, I don't know how. It, I feel like there is nothing I can say. I'm better in person. And even that is not the words. It's just being there. Have you had other people experience something like that, that they no longer know what to say? I have noticed more than I have heard it. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. Why do I say it's okay? It's when I post something on social media, I'm not looking for the likes, the comments, or anything. When I post something on social media that has to do with loss, I'm hoping that whoever reads is encouraged. encouraged. Whether you put the thumbs up or not, doesn't matter. Did you read? Mm-hmm. Did it talk? To, did it speak to you? Yeah. That's all I need. So today I shared a desiderata, mm-hmm. the, the the poem from 1927. I didn't even know it's that old. Mm-hmm. I told people just take time and read it, because it has a lot of healing words. Whether anybody responds, reacts or not, doesn't matter. Did you read? That's what for, for me. Social media when you post something, don't post with expectation that people will like it or will share a caring emoji or a love or a comment. For you who is struggling or wonders what to say, saying nothing is also okay. You can pick up the phone call and speak to the person. I'm better at that. Yeah. Actually picking up the yeah. phone and calling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Social media, I just... You, I don't have a problem because we've walked a journey. True. But for most people, especially when it's raw mm. and happening right now, mm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, how do you go about honoring, you know, the people you've lost, but still be making joyous? Do you have anything special you do? Do you still celebrate? I know some people still celebrate birthdays and things like that. Do you have anything you do? I I'm a birthday person, so I remember people's births. So next year, next week should be my sister's 57th birthday. And the same, so I recognize people's birthdays and the 
day they died. Even if I can remember the day the person fell ill, I will recognize that. Sometimes I share on social media, sometimes I don't, but the one person I share with is my brother and my niece, who the daughter of my sister who died. Because that's the immediate family that's left. So I share with them. And I share with them not because I want them to feel the way I'm feeling. Just to let, let's remember this person. This mm -hmm. person was really good to us. But another thing that also helps me to honor people are songs. I get a lot of healing from music. And I, as a Christian, it's a lot of music. And even sometimes it's not even Christian music. It could be a song like Kirk Franklin and Smile. Um, even when it's hard, you smile. It's a Christian song still, but yeah, well, you know what I mean. My sister, we didn't have many songs that we shared, but there were songs that I remember from sundown days mm -hmm. that she loved. And now hear that song, I'm like, oh my God, that reminds me of Shiro. Or my mother, the superwoman in the Presbyterian church would sing and sing. And it, I did remember how when she started having dementia, she could never break into a song. Yeah. So I appreciate the fact that she taught us, or she made us get to know very many songs. So did my dad. So I'll hear a song and I'll be like, oh my God, that reminds me of dad. And I will cherish it. My other two brothers didn't really sing. <laughs> but I find things that I that celebrate, celebrate about them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So in, uh, I know we talked about it wasn't, you know, forgiveness because, you know, part of for you forgiving yourself from the guilt and also, also, you know, forgiving them because mm. blame is also for you to let that go is about forgiveness. Does that, did you let that go completely? Does it, you know, rear its head at some other point when you're feeling a certain way? Does it go completely? How, how does that work? Hmm. You've taken me back to 2009 mm -hmm. when I went home and I told my parents that, again, I am pregnant. <laughs> and again, there's no ring on my finger. <laughs> and this time it's from a different dad. Not the... Oh, yeah. my God. I will never forget the look on my father's face. He was so disappointed. And so he died having never met my daughters and therefore forgive my stupidity because that's how he looked at it because he said, I've always prayed for you to have wisdom. So it's not celebrating the fact that I'm pregnant, but he's thinking, like, seriously, woman, mm -hmm. <laughs> stop already. And the fact that I'm carrying twins at that point, he celebrated the fact that there were twins because between him and his younger brother, there were many twins that never made it. Mm -hmm. So I'm the first person with living twins in my entire in your family. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that feeling of, oh my God, giving myself power. Like, did I make my dad die of sadness? Oh, wow. How is he going to save face in church that his daughter is pregnant again? again? Different man, unmarried. Then I realized, I, sh I know I have power, but Mazi, I don't have the power to kill my dad like that. Mm -hmm. But I had to process it. Yeah. I had to process that. It's it had nothing to do with me, and my dad was a very forgiving man. And even if he wasn't, at least the one person who's forgiving is God. Yeah. So just those conversations you have with yourself. And the other thing, other than forgiving myself, even forgiving other people that I blamed, I realized I'm blaming them for things that either we did to ourselves, um, I, I could I'll give the perfect examples. The fact that my two of my, bro my brothers died, I could have sat down and decided to blame my sisters-in-law. Why would I? My brothers were adults. Mm -hmm. they, they led their lives the way they chose to lead their lives. And to then shift the blame and start thinking something negative about my sisters-in-law, first I'm giving them a lot of power and I'm being very unfair. Mm -hmm. Everybody is in charge of their own lives. If they were children, that would be a different story. But they're adults. They were adults. So just letting, forgiving people and knowing that people do the best they can with what they have. Rhonda Britton, a, a psychologist, like to say, always treat people as if they're innocent. Because people are as innocent as far as their wisdom is, or as far as their wisdom goes. When my dad uttered those words, it was what, what his wisdom said. I was not going to 
uh, get rid of my kids to make my ma- my parents, my parents happy. happy. I could have. I wouldn't. It's a choice I made not to. Um, and I know very many girls, perhaps, and this is really important to say this, that very many girls end up going down the road of abortion, not because they themselves cannot carry the baby to term, but because they are worried about the society. Mm-hmm. And then they would deal with the grief of the unborn child, for, which for was driven by what? Other people, society. Mm-hmm. And then they will be bitter towards those people, never forgiving them, and never have given them the opportunity to actually blame. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to show my mother I'm pregnant. So they actually never gave them the opportunity. Yeah. So uh, we have to own our decisions and we have to own our journeys and everybody's journey is different. If you have a conversation with my brother Kamau, it's not going to look like this. I'm sure it's very different. <laughs> it's yeah. very different mm-hmm. because we all process all situations differently. differently. Even if you go through the same journey, we process it very differently. Yeah, because I'm sure even for my brother and even for my parents, losing Paul is, it's an individual journey Absolutely. and very, very different for each one of us. Yeah. So, and I like the word journey because healing, I think a lot of us look at healing as an end. Mm. But I don't think it is an end. How, what would you, you know, tell people going through it and looking to get to a certain point and it's all done and finished? What advice would you give? What like, I can't wait I until this is all over because uh, that person is looking at it. There's a point where it will come and I no longer, I am healed. Are we ever healed? No, no. we are not. <laughs> it goes back to what I had said at the beginning. There will always be a situation that will trigger something. Yeah. Yeah. I've, on first, I was riding the car with my cousin and he was driving so fast that I, when I got home the following day, I actually called my brother, Ken's daughter. I said, I was riding with my cousin and he reminded me of your dad because Ken used to drive fast. How he did not die on the road, I don't know. <laughs> that, that was like the very obvious way he was likely to die, but mm-hmm. he didn't. Um, so you will find things that will always remind you of that pain. But remind yourself that you're still healing. The journey is ongoing and there is no end. Because you will never be at that position where you feel, oh, I am now healed. It's not an, it, you don't need an antibiotic. No, it's not, no. It's not an antibiotic. No. Mm-hmm. Just allow yourself the grace that moments when you feel sad, acknowledge that I'm not feeling good today. I'm having a bit of a downer today. But find somebody that you can talk to. Don't feel down by yourself. And don't choose a self-destructive path. Uh, whatever the self-destructive path looks to you, don't choose that. Mm -hmm. Look for healthy ways of dealing. I talked about Calm earlier, the campaign against living miserably. It's a free platform. You just go online, you call, and somebody will be helping you on the other side of the line. Someone you will never, ever come across. They'll be there to help you. But you cannot go through a journey if you're not self-aware of how you're feeling, and you can't go through the journey no end without knowing that what you're feeling is normal because you're a human being we sometimes we're really hard on ourselves yeah so as that desiderata actually ends it says we be at peace with god or whoever it is that your spiritual being is just be, be at peace with him because that's where you will get your sense of hope you will get courage you will get strength even if you can't see if you don't have, if you're not a Buddhist and you can't see, whatever it is that form of spiritual source of energy is, of wisdom, just hang on to it. Other people can come along, but people cannot come along when they find you, they get tired. Eh? If people, every time they come, they see, find you all sad, you don't talk to them, you drain them, the negative energy. People, people leave. leave. And it's actually not people. It's all of us. No one wants negative energy around them mm. all the time. And don't blame them. No, and, and, and I've been there, yeah. you know, where you're feeling like you're the drainer. Mm. And you actually, even for you for yourself, it's mm. worse because you start stop avoiding people. Mm. Because now you know you're a drainer. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to be around people because mm-hmm. you feel, and that's even worse for you. Mm. So in conclusion, what 
few words of wisdom. Uh, I know wisdom, you know, it's not really wisdom, but you've gone through the journey. So we'll say you have some wisdom mm. about someone who is navigating healing um, through the pain. And I know it's different for everyone, but what's the words of wisdom? Like one sentence that you would at least look out for these things or do these things or, you know, for just as a, as a guide. Okay. I would say always remember you never walk alone. We are relations, relational human beings. We tend to n kind of navigate life with other people. Whether married or single, there is nobody who doesn't know somebody. But whoever it is that you lean on for support, whoever it is that you walk the journey with, just make sure that the person is walking you down the journey that is healthy. Yeah. This is not the person who is going to tell you, let's go for a pint. A person is not going to help you. The person is going to actually break you. So choose the people that support you very well. Be very, very gentle with yourself. Know the journey is going to be hard. There are times it will be really hard, like maybe around birthdays, around Christmas, if it's a a loved one, maybe a partner or a spouse who has died, maybe around Valentine's, Valentine's will be very yeah. dark, maybe your own birthday to be very dark. Recognize those patterns, but you really have to slow down. Slow down, recognize those patterns, and seek help. So you can seek help from your friend, you can seek help from a therapist, just don't do, don't do it alone. Just don't do we it were alone. created for each other, let's lean on each other. Thank you so much, Maggie. This has been so informative and in sharing something we really rarely share, but yet we all go through it. Um, even within our own friends, our own families will lose a loved one or experience loss in the same family, and we still don't share it in the family. So thank you so much for encouraging us in this journey as we walk through it together. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you so, so much for listening to this podcast as we walk through life, grief, healing. It's not a place you have to be permanently. It is a place you can come out of. And if you're going through it right now, I know it feels like it's the impossible, but healing does come. And unfortunately, in this life, we will all go through all kinds of losses. So if you know someone who is going through loss or you want yourself to know more about it, please comment below. Let us know what help you need and we'll see what we can provide and subscribe so we can have more conversations. Thank you very much.